What's up everybody, John the Morgyle here with another edition of Flat Earth, Short and Sweet, where we outline physical evidence and observations which either debunk the globe or theory or exhibit the Earth's lack of curvature and motion. In the last section, we discussed certain lunar observations which are geometrically impossible according to the ball earth theory. For a quick recap, the heliocentric model demands the full moon be positioned on the opposite side of the Earth from the sun. This means the full moon should always be positioned on the night side of the Earth. Yet there are countless examples where the full moon was observed overhead during the middle of the day. The same problem is exemplified whenever a crescent moon is observed in the middle of the night as the crescent moon phase must be positioned on the day side of the Earth according to the geometry demanded by the ball Earth theory. If you didn't get a chance to see the previous video in this series, here's a card with a link to the video. I'll also place a link in the description and at the end screen of this video. Keeping this section within a similar vein as the first, we'll review some astonishing facts surrounding solar eclipses which fundamentally disagree with the ball earth theory further discrediting the standard accepted model through solar and lunar observations now if we assume the earth is a ball for argument's sake and accept the standard explanation for solar eclipses there are simple physical evidence and observations which categorically are incompatible with the geometry of the ball earth theory. If one single piece of physical evidence proves to be absolutely contrary to the current accepted standard model of the world, then the entire hypothetical construct of the spinning ball becomes a failed theory, which must be discarded. The scientific method is the most effective process to bring us closer to the truth by the process of elimination. So if verifiable physical evidence disagrees with a given hypothesis or a model, then you must either modify or discard said hypothesis. Uh, for example, it's claimed by the standard model that the moon is about 2,000 miles in diameter, positioned at an average distance of about 240,000 miles from the Earth. These values are considered as absolute, unquestionable facts, so if we find physical evidence which disagrees with these values, the rest of the ball Earth model falls apart. When you find multiple instances of such evidence or observations which simply don't jive with the standard model, the ball Earth theory is driven further into the realm of absurdity and impossibility. When you find multiple instances of such evidence or observations which don't jive with the standard model, the ball Earth theory is driven further into the realm of absurdity and impossibility. While there's plenty of physical evidence which shows the Earth to lack any and all motion, as well as the necessary curvature to result in a sphere, it is necessary to address astronomical observations which disagree with the ball Earth hypothesis. This is because many of the fundamental pillars of the ball Earth theory are founded upon astronomical observations. For one example, it's claimed that since we see round objects in the sky, the Earth must therefore be a round object in the sky. For another example, it's believed that the world spins upon its axis due to the apparent rotation of the stars around Polaris. When observing such stars from the Earth, there is really no way to tell whether the Earth is spinning with its axis aligned to Polaris or if the stars are spinning around Polaris above a stationary Earth. Of course, the globe Earth proponents will claim the rotation of the stars as exclusive proof of a spinning ball Earth in spite of physical experiments such as Aries' failure which prove the Earth is at rest while starlight is in motion through the ether. It's also worth mentioning that if the Earth were spinning and the stars were essentially stationary, there should also be a plethora of physical evidence proving the Earth's rotational motion as well as orbital velocity. Of course, no such evidence exists in all of the scientific record. The process of elimination seems to be ignored when it comes to the ball Earth theory. 
Whenever evidence is shown to disagree with the geometry or the physics of the standard model, convoluted apologies are crafted instead of altering the theory or shelving it altogether. For example, when it's shown that there's no possible way our axis could remain aligned to Polaris for thousands of years due to the alleged axial precession of the world, then we clearly must alter the model to account for the permanent alignment between Polaris and our axis. It's extremely difficult for people to come to terms with the truth about our natural world being fixed and flat, not because of any evidence that proves curvature or mind-boggling velocities demanded by the globe theory, but instead due to a lifetime of programming through the educational system, the mass media, pop culture, and governmental psyops such as NASA. The best way to overcome the unshakable belief in the ball earth is to continue showing verifiable evidence which refutes the theory. So, solar eclipses, as mentioned, entail several attributes which are incompatible with the geometry of the ball Earth. The single biggest problem with solar eclipses is the fact that the shadow of the moon cast upon the Earth is usually around 50 to 100 miles in diameter, although it fluctuates depending on the eclipse. Such a shadow simply could not be cast by an object with a diameter of 2,000 miles positioned some 240,000 miles away from the Earth. Anyone can verify that if you have a single light source which is obscured by a single object, the shadow cast by said object will either be of a similar angular size or larger than the object obstructing the light source. This is not a theory or a claim, but a basic fact of light and shadow. Anyone can run a test to demonstrate and verify this fact as it applies to all opaque objects in nature. Except for the ball Earth and Moon, of course. They're given a pass on this immutable law of physics as the shadow cast by the Moon during a solar eclipse is usually 50 to 100 miles in diameter and in several cases the shadow cast by the moon has been much much smaller as little as two or three miles in diameter again the diameter of the moon's shadow should either stay the same angular size or increase angular size proportionally with distance from the moon it certainly shouldn't taper off into a point that's convenient for the globe earth theory but has never been demonstrated in reality of course uh, this claim can be proven by anyone who cares to spend just a bit of time with a uh, flashlight, a tennis ball, and a wall. Under no circumstances can you cast a shadow of a smaller radius than the tennis ball, especially with extremely long distances between the light, the ball, and the wall. If the moon were the size of a tennis ball, then the earth would be about the size of a basketball, the moon would be positioned about 26 feet from the basketball and the light source representing the sun would be a whopping two miles away. If you could possibly get the conditions and alignments right to successfully complete such a test, it goes without saying that the tennis ball shadow would be at least the diameter of the tennis ball, certainly not a few millimeters in diameter as purported by the globe earth model. The ball earth theory demands the opposite of this immutable law of light and shadow, which is a running theme when it comes to the ball. The globe theory demands the moon's shadow diminishes in angular size with distance. While there is no physical experiment or natural example one can point to which supports this bizarre behavior of the moon's shadow, it is accepted, however, as a scientific fact. An entire convoluted theory of sunlight converging at a point in space and then diverging from that point prior to hitting the moon, thus casting a shadow which behaves in the opposite manner as demanded by nature. And such behavior, again, cannot be replicated in a lab. Such a process of back-engineering excuses to force observations to fit your paradigm or your theory is the opposite of science. All celestial observations and tests begin with the axiom that the world must be a spinning ball flying around in space 
regardless of any contrary evidence which presents itself. The astonishing fact involving the moon's shadow being way too small for the standard model is a prime example of this willful ignorance and never-ending apologetics on the part of theoretical physics and astronomy. This is not to say that all astronomers in the world are actively deceiving us. The truth is quite the contrary. In truth, every person on the world was indoctrinated into the belief that the Earth is a spinning ball when we were very young. It is taken for granted as an unquestionable fact which results in ridicule of anyone merely questioning the validity of this belief in a spherical orbiting world. So, instead of interpreting the raw data of uh, the moon's shadow, for example, during an eclipse at face value, as the unbiased process of science demands, wild theoretical hoops are jumped through in order to protect the belief system we were indoctrinated into as children. Were science to adhere to the method of its namesake, the estimated size and distance of the moon should be drastically altered due to the fact that its shadow is usually less than 100 miles in diameter and has been recorded as little as 2 miles in diameter. Instead of modifying the values for the moon's size and distance, creative and peculiar theories are crafted to protect the values and the paradigm in general. When the shadow of the moon strikes the Earth during an eclipse, it's absolutely unique in the sense that it is the only type of event where physical evidence is readily available for direct measurement of a celestial object's size. We know exactly how large the shadow of the moon is on a given eclipse. Since the diameter of the moon's shadow will vary from one eclipse to another, we can assume for one possibility that the relative distance between the Sun and the Moon and the Earth varies. According to the Ball Earth theory, we should expect to see the shadow of the Moon during an eclipse render a shadow with a diameter of at least 2,000 miles since that's the alleged diameter of the Moon. It would actually be more likely to expect a much larger diameter shadow due to the alleged distance between the Sun, the Moon, and the Earth. Go into a dark room with a flashlight and cast shadows with a given object, varying the distance between the light source, the obstructing object, and the wall upon which the shadow will fall. You'll find that it's rare to see the diameter of the shadow match that of the obstructing object. In other words, the angular size of the shadow typically will increase with distance from the obstructing object, and in most cases the shadow will be much larger than the obstructing object. Never will you create a combination of distances which cause the shadow of the obstructing object to be smaller than that of the obstructing object. The shadows simply do not taper off into a point or diminish in angular size with distance from the obstructing object. There are of course plenty of other problems with solar and lunar eclipses that we could touch upon However, keeping this video in spirit with the series as short and sweet, uh, we're going to leave it at that. The simple fact is the shadow of the moon is very compelling evidence against the ball earth theory. And instead of following the evidence, science follows the theory. So with that, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I hope it was informative and I really appreciate you watching. If you'd like to support this channel, your help is greatly needed. You can make a one-time contribution to the channel effort at www.paypal.me slash themorgyle or a recurring contribution through uh, Patreon at www.patreon.com slash themorgyle. So with that, God bless you all. Thanks again for watching. And as always, spread the word, spread the world, and peace out, everybody.